you pray with me before we have our scripture this morning? God of grace and of glory, we are so grateful to be with you on this day. We're so grateful to um, hear news of what is happening in the larger church, and we're so happy to receive um, the excitement around um, so many projects, the um, worshipful um, atmosphere that we find when we sing with our praise band, the way in which um, we greet our community. Um, it's a busy season in Marquette, and uh, we love being a part of that as a church and as people who interact with all of those who come to town. Um, God, just be with us as we take some time out um, from all of it to um, spend some Sabbath time with you and with each other. Um, be with us as we continue um, to grow together. In Je Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of James. We are working our way through this summer series that is focusing on growth, um, growth of each of us personally more so than growth of the church. Um, we're putting names and faces on growth, growth, spiritual growth that happens in each of us. So this is um, James writing his epistle, and in my Bible, um, it is prefaced with these words. This passage is prefaced with these words, live well, live wisely. Do you want to be counted wise? To build a reputation for wisdom? Here is what you do. Live well, live wisely, live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. Mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourselves sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It's cunning, devilish plotting. Whenever you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at the other's throats. Real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized by getting along with others. It's gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessings, not hot one day and cold the next, not two-faced. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoys its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. Where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you want your own way and fight for it deep inside yourselves. You lust for what you don't have and are willing to kill to get it. You want what isn't yours and will risk violence to get your hands on it. You wouldn't think of just asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know you'll be asking for what you have no right to. <laughs> You're spoiled children, each one in your own way. So let God work his will in you. Yell aloud no to the devil and watch him make himself scarce. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I first started looking 
at some commentaries on this text from James early this week, knowing that it was going to be a busy week. We had the memorial service yesterday for Zane Bard at First Campus, and really our heart and soul and preparation went into that service, and then the day after that, you know, Sunday is always coming, right? So you will understand what I read and what I considered. The preacher encountering this text might be forgiven for the sudden urge to suggest in lieu of the sermon that the congregation engage in a time of silent prayer. I thought, great idea, done, check, let's do that. Oh, the question keeps coming up, doesn't it? As we continue to build community, particularly in this worship series, as we consider um, the depth of our own spiritual connection with God and with each other. Who is wise among us? Who is understanding among us? Who is gentle? Sometimes when we talk about who is gentle, we might think, if we're a tough guy, well, I don't, I'm not going to be gentle, right? We think about being meek or timid, maybe. But I do have to say that never, when reading through the gospel stories, did I ever think that Jesus was meek or timid. But he certainly, at times, not all the time, was gentle. We understand that because of the strength and the power of God, that strength and power which is present inside of us, as we come to hear this call of gentleness, this spiritual gift of gentleness, we are neither meek nor are we timid, quite the opposite. We talked about this actually yesterday, remembering Zane Bard. Some of you knew Zane. Um, Zane was a person filled with humility and filled with gentleness and filled with a fierceness in his faith, right? So that's what we're talking about today. Today's passage selected to help us understand the way in which we are called to nurture growth our own growth, the growth of others. When we plant something, our work isn't done, right? We've planted it, then what, right? Comes from the book of James. Let's talk about James just for a minute. James is one of 21 letters that we find in the New Testament. It comes right before 1 Peter. And James is identified in the first verse of the first chapter as James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Traditionally, this James is understood to be the brother of Jesus. But of course, we have James, the son of Alphaeus, James, the son of Zebedee, and all of the other men named James that we may or may not be aware of. So it's believed that the letter was written by James, the brother of Jesus, prior, of course, to the Jerusalem Council, after we read the things that occurred in Galatians and Acts, the things that were so dangerous and so horrific, the persecution that happened to the people wondering about what it would look like to be the church, wondering what it might look like to be followers of Jesus Christ. It is not believed that he was in dialogue with Paul, who wrote so many other letters. It's understood that James was writing to Jewish Christians living outside of Israel, living pretty difficult and complicated lives, trying to find their way to following Jesus. And James offers them real-life practical advice for how they might do that, how they might grow as persons and communities of faith. 
We do know that James, the brother of Jesus, was killed in the year 62 during the priesthood of Aeneas. Therefore, this letter, if he wrote it, was most likely one of the oldest books in the New Testament. James writes, to encourage, or as we might say, to nurture these believers. He urges patience. He urges people to live consistently with what Jesus taught. And when he wrote this letter, Jesus didn't teach very long before that, right? So for him to say, remember what Jesus taught, it wasn't so long ago like it is for us when we say, what is it that Jesus taught? Let me read that again. He warns against hypocrisy and pride and slander, and he points out the fact that the human tongue, quite frankly, sometimes does more harm than good. And he writes, our only hope is to some extent keep it under control. Because, dear friends, once again, as we have been discussing in this series so far, we reap what we sow. A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. It's poor form to plant something and then walk away from it and forget about it. Now, there are some things you can do that with, like hostas or irises, right, daylilies, some things you just throw them in the ground and walk away and that's it, and they come up by themselves no matter what. But there are many, many things that are planted, and then if you walk away and they aren't nurtured properly, they will not grow, and the church is one of these things. I would suggest that we are really, really pretty good at planting seeds in the church. And on the video, you heard about a lot of seeds being planted by United Methodists in Michigan and beyond. But what James is asking us to think about is the nurturing that has to come after the seed is planted because the people of God in the church of God were not hostas and we're not irises, nor are we daylilies. And we take a little TLC. We could point out, as it has been pointed out by famous theologians like Martin Luther, that the book of James is a little chaotic in its construction. In fact, Martin Luther suggested that the book of James be sidelined and included only as an appendix and not in the actual New Testament. Um, he called it an epistle of straw because it was so disorganized. This letter written to encourage people living a hard life. Some would argue that perhaps it should be moved and not included with the letters, that perhaps it's more of wisdom literature, like a, like a big poem, and it should be included somewhere else. James uses the following metaphors in what some would suggest is a rather random and less than clearly organized way to get his point across. He uses a horse with a bridle, simple and straightforward. I don't feel that we really have to spell this out very far for one another. I think we get it. The one who controls the horse's tongue with the bit in its mouth controls the whole body. Think about a ship's rudder, he says. Outside forces like wind and waves can take the ship. The captain who controls the rudder, though, can weather difficult circumstances and emerge intact and on course. And this is what we must do as we build the church. The third example he uses is flame. We've been talking about that. We've had some... Uh, Fire fi fires out of control. We've been talking about the flames of Pentecost, um, all of it. Um, some flame is good and some flame not so much. But here's what James says. Flame not under the control of anyone, uncontrolled and uncontrollable, bringing nothing but destruction. 
is what we're not wanting to be, just to be clear, in the church. There was outside the city of Jerusalem a big trash dump that was always burning and always being fed with more trash. So just to point out, that's an image for you um, of sort of a tongue out of control and what can happen if that is fed and fed and fed and that could be a whole other sermon all by itself. So we hear all of these. These make sense to us. These are um, examples and images and metaphors that we can still grasp. And so we might be asking the same question as those who originally heard James's words, and it would perhaps be this one. So what are we supposed to do? Given that we have the tongues we have, and we are the people that we are, <laughs> here's the challenge and the word of reassurance. We should not be led astray because we are God's children. So just like a fig tree isn't going to bear olives or a grapevine isn't going to bear figs, we, the children of God, must therefore bear the fruits that we have been envisioned by God, knit together so carefully and so well by God to bear. We can't at the same time bless God, <laughs> though, and curse people made in the divine image of God. So even if we decide that we ourselves are doing a pretty good job at this, we also have to live together, right? James sifts wisdom from tough, real-life situations he knew that people were facing. Again, we can still understand what he is looking at because we're still looking at it. He contrasts poverty and wealth the plight of orphans and widows, the hopelessness of working endlessly for low and inadequate wages. How does the church nurture people who are in distress? How ought people of faith to respond to these challenges? Seems like we're in about the same spot as those who James was trying to encourage in the first place. How do we set our sights on searching out this gentleness of wisdom that comes more easily to some of us than to others, perhaps? Gentleness of wisdom which is pure and peaceable, reasonable and obedient, full of mercy and of good fruits, impartial and sincere. It sounds so good wise leaders, which we are all trying to be. Did you catch that in the video? There was a part at annual conference where they, they interviewed laity. That's all of you save Erica. <laughs> laity about how they have grown their churches. They didn't interview all the clergy. Clergy love to talk. I'm sure clergy would have been lined up and saying, interview me, I'll tell you how I've grown my church. But how have the laity grown the churches? Because it is our work to do together, right? So James knew that. James is raising up leaders, meaning everyone, because everyone can lead in some direction or another in the kingdom of God especially if the greater world and community seems to be focused on things like jealousy and resentment, which lead to rebellion and all kinds of ungodly behavior, such as conflict in the community, especially when we start to listen, all of us who are leaders, and what we hear, the conversation focusing on are the things we don't have, all that we lack. And when we let those emotions of scarcity and what isn't fair to us take hold. Perhaps it could be said that it's harder now more than ever, or harder now more than in recent decades 
to live in the world and also in our community of faith as the world and the community of faith seem to be moving further and further apart. So we more than ever must rely on collective wisdom to stay on track, right? To keep that rudder going where it needs to go. We would do well then to rely on the words of James, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Run toward God and God will run toward you. Remember that we've been taught that will know wisdom by its fruits. Remember that we've been taught to never stop searching for these fruits of the Spirit, having confidence that since we have been and are being ourselves cared for, that we're okay, we have each other, we can stop worrying about ourselves. Not only do we have each other, God is with us. God doesn't leave us. Our bishop said that. And so therefore, we can spend our energy nurturing others. We are asked to trust that if wisdom is present, then the grace of God is there. And we've been taught to watch out for false wisdom, selfish ambition, uh, false wisdom looks inward, right? Not outward. False wisdom doesn't bear fruit. True wisdom includes the things we might identify as goodness, the things that we might identify as evidence that wisdom and grace are nurtured and growing. We learn from this letter that James wrote that good things happen when we live faithful lives, that we'll come to a good place. And even if we say, oh, I knew that, it's good to be reminded, isn't it? We wrap up today with a few questions we are left to ponder as we continue this series on growth. We think about nurturing. From what worldly, so-called wisdom, might James be calling the church to repent? From what so-called worldly wisdom might James be calling the church to repent? What might it mean for the church once more to draw near to God? How do we go about examining ourselves closely? We who make up the church often have difficult decisions to make, don't we? And as we explore what we're going to do and what direction we're going to turn our rudder in, right? We discuss these difficult decisions, turns out we don't always agree all the time with each other. We are reminded today that along with the serious business of being the church and finding our way forward, particularly when we don't all agree, we have confidence in the good gifts of God we are reminded that we are called to nurture this world around us with these nutrients of joy and love and grace. I have beautiful hanging baskets that I got at Nagelkirk's before Zachary's graduation party, and I was looking at them yesterday, and I was thinking, they look okay, but they could look better. What's going on? We've had all this drought, but we've been good about watering them until the water flows through. What's the problem? And then I thought, Oh, in my busyness, I have not given them any plant food at all whatsoever. They don't have the nutrients they're supposed to have to grow. So I'm going to find time to do that really soon so that they can be just that sort of bursting, beautiful color that I was imagining in my head. We're asked to model peaceful relationships with one another to the best of our ability. And we can do this. With the grace of God, we can do this. Like a ship with its rudder, emerging intact and on course toward our goal of being nurturers in God's kingdom. Let's pray. God, as you call us to this role of nurturing, it is a role of gentleness 
and wisdom. Sometimes those things are hard for us because we are busy and we are moving fast through life. So slow our hearts and our minds and our bodies. Give us time to search for these things. Keep us always looking for peace. And God, as we go this week into our community, as we encounter those we know and those we don't, as we have opportunity to play host to tourists from all over, God, give us this patience. Remind us, remind us that we are equipped to model peace and to bring peace into your world which continues to need these words from the letter that James wrote. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope you're enjoying Pod Church. Please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and be notified each time there's a new video. To learn more about everything that's happening in and around Marquette Hope, check out our Facebook page. You can also get our newsletter on the Facebook as well. Church is the weekly online worship of Marquette Hope, a United Methodist faith community located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Find us at facebook.com slash mqthope, mqthope.com, and on YouTube.